Um, so my name is Mark Bryant. I'm CEO of Thermofluidics. Uh, prior to joining Thermofluidics, I worked at Accenture for 23 years, and I was managing director of communications and high tech across Europe and Latin America there, and ran that. That was about a $2 billion business. And uh, I was very strongly drawn to the role at Thermofluidics. I, I think some of the technology we have is uh, potentially game-changing, very innovative, very exciting, and I'm looking forward to sharing some of that with you today. Now, as we were preparing for this presentation, somebody had the audacity to say that pumping was not sexy. <laughs> well, it may not be sexy, but it is pervasive. <clears throat> and I think Mark spoke a little about this earlier in his, his comments. Uh, something like a fifth of the world's electricity uh, is used in pumps, so it is pervasive. And obviously not all the, the pumps in the world are electric, there are nice polluting diesel ones to go with it. Uh, and if we look at a pump over its lifetime, something like 90% of the cost is actually to do with running it, not to do with buying it. And therefore, it's, a lot of it is down to the fuel to run it, uh, some of it is down to the maintenance. And um, what I would like you to do in the context of our technology, and I exaggerate a little bit to make the point, is to imagine a world where we can get rid of that energy and all of that pollution. And in that context, our technology essentially takes in heat and creates a pumping motion through an evaporation and condensation cycle. Uh, it's very cheap to make because the materials are low cost and the manufacturing process is very straightforward. Uh, it's cheap to run because the fuel is often free. Put that in the context of the earlier slide of 90% of the cost being to do with fuel. Uh, and it is very versatile in terms of the things that it can pump and consequently the applications it's suitable for. These are a number of uh, potential applications for our technology. So if you think in the developing world, you think of water for irrigation, for drinking, for sanitation, many good applications for taking heat and doing pumping in that context. In the developed world, there are many, many industrial processes which generate waste heat, and that is thrown away. We have the capability to harness that and do useful work with it. Uh, if I pick one here in terms of uh, agricultural, this is complete waste of time, isn't it, this, this laser? Uh, so in the context of agricultural irrigation, clearly that's a sort of develop, develop, developing world application. Um, we also see it as a developed world application. In fact, we got a grant from the California Energy Commission to develop our technology because, you know, think of California, think of all the fruit and the crops. Uh, the amount of electricity that goes into doing the irrigation for all of that is very significant indeed, and they say the opportunity to eliminate that cost and all of those emissions by using our technology. I think also uh, we've got CHP up there, combined heat and power. These are big devices which provide electricity for hospitals and utilities, for example. Um, they generate electricity and they generate a lot of heat. And the electricity is the thing that they're focused on using. There's a lot of spare heat available. So if you're a utility, let's say somewhere in America, uh, you are running a process seven days a week, 24 hours a day called aeration, where you're bubbling air, sorry, bubbling air through dirty water in order to, to cleanse it. And um, that is done with an electric pump seven days a week, 24 hours a day, all around the world, and we have the opportunity to replace all of that with our technology using the spare heat. I think also uh, these are siloed type applications. If you think holistically, if you're maybe a factory manager or something, there are many potential um, areas where if you're looking to achieve a zero carbon footprint, there may be the opportunity to take a lot of heat in your factory and turn it into useful work uh, and use our technology to uh, avoid using electricity. Um, talked about the developing world and the developed world. I want to share with you now uh, an, an application which 
We've been shortlisted for um, an award from the Wellcome Trust, and the Wellcome Trust is the largest charity in the UK, very much focused on health issues. And they want to use our technology to uh, essentially irrigate land and produce crops much, much more effectively than is done today. And uh, what you see here is uh, a, a picture of, of women operating treadle pumps. Uh, and that's used to irrigate a lot in the developing world. Uh, these pumps require you to essentially sort of pretend you're riding a bicycle for sort of four hours a day, something of that nature. And through that motion, that provides the labor or the fuel to drive the irrigation process. And these pumps can take water from up to six meters, typically, underground, and then use that to irrigate land. Um, our technology and what the Wellcome Trust is interested in uh, is able to take water from up to 100 meters underground. So there's an additional 94 meter opportunity there. Uh, and these pumps, when they get the water on the surface, just distribute the water. Uh, our pumps are able to generate 10 bar of pressure which enables you to do high pressure um, drip fed irrigation, which is acknowledged to be the most efficient means of growing crops, providing water exactly to the root system at the right time at the right frequency. And we believe that uh, through that approach, we can increase the income of um, smallholders who are living on a dollar a day who are malnourished by up to $900 a year, which is a significant increase for those people. Uh, the final comment I'd like to make is that in addition to, because, because our pump is driven using heat, uh, there is actually no labor involved. So you can save four hours a day. Clearly that's a beneficial thing for, in this picture, a lot of women who spend four hours a day doing that. There's also the opportunity um, to use the technology for drinking water. And we all know the stories about women culturally being requested to go and source drinking water from a long way away and bring it back. Uh, that takes a lot of time as well, involves some danger sometimes. Our technology could well enable uh, all of that to be done away with and then women can focus on um, more important things, for example, like education. Um, so in terms of our technology, as I said before, it's driven by heat. So there is no diesel, there's no electricity. Uh, this is not photovoltaics, all right? Uh, this is low-cost solar collectors, for example, or waste heat from industrial or domestic sources. Um, in terms of cost, it's a fraction of a photovoltaic alternative, ranges from three times cheaper to ten times cheaper, depending on the application. The reason it's so much cheaper is twofold. One is to make it is much lower cost, lower cost materials in terms of plastics and aluminium lower cost manufacturing processes in terms of molding, casting, and extrusion. So that's making it. And then in terms of running it, uh, as I said before, the fuel is typically free. Uh, the other benefit we have, you know, if I go back to the treadle pump analogy I was using before, one of the things um, that causes smallholders to stop using those is because the seals go on a regular basis. That's a big problem. Uh, in fact, in one study over three years, they went, I worked out on a weekly basis. Our, our technology doesn't have that problem because it doesn't have dynamic seals. Okay, so that is um, a little bit there on, on our offering. This is, I think, a short video. And I'll be honest with you, it's a bit like working with children and dogs. I've yet to got the thing, get the thing to work. But anyway, we're going to give it a go. Uh, and th what, this sh what this will possibly show is uh, our technology working in a lab environment, uh, and it also has a compare and contrast with a diesel alternative just for a bit of fun. And there's volume on this as well. So this is our technology. The blue illustrates the pumping going on. Uh, this is pumping at about 1,300 liters an hour, uh, which is sufficient to irrigate a small holding. And this is just a bit of fun, really. I, I think we've got the point. So 
as it says on the slide, no contest. <coughs> um, it would, if it would be possible to go back to the slide presentation and the next slide, possibly. Oh, I've got to do that. Um, I've repeated this slide because what I want to do is not explain to you in gory detail how our technology works, every single application. What I'm trying to do is communicate that by using heat, there is a huge opportunity to get rid of electricity and diesel in many applications. And that's really the thing I want to, to log with all of you, is the massive opportunity here, both in the developing world and the developed world. OK, so that's enough on our technology. Let me now talk to you a little bit about our company, Thermofluidics. Uh, this is the management team. You can't see any of them, so uh, they're all extremely good looking. Uh, <coughs> Tom Smith is the inventor of the technology, uh, extremely talented chap. I think one of the best engineers on the planet in his field. Uh, and Tom Law uh, came top of his, um, his university four years on the trot and has tremendous expertise as well. I think. The macro point I'd like you to take is that as a management team, we have tremendous commercial, technical, and prototyping expertise, which is core to our business. The second thing is in terms of intellectual property, and again, you may not be able to read all the detail there, but our core patents have been granted, and we own all of them. OK, in terms of our um, business model, <coughs> we're very much focused on what it is we do best. We do not have a desire to build a global manufacturing and distribution company. That would take an awful lot of money and take an awful long time. So we are looking for world-class partners who uh, can work with us to bring this uh, technology to market uh, by application and by geography. These are a number of the players that we've had strong discussions with and are keen to participate. Grunfoss, um, is the world leader in circulators. You'll almost certainly have one in your home attached to your boiler pumping the water around your house. They sell about 20 million of those a year, and their chief engineer is very interested in our technology. Uh, Jane Irrigation, again, a very well-known um, company in India. They own more than half the drip-fed irrigation market there. Um, they've supplied us with some of their technology um, to help with testing uh, and for offered field uh, test facilities for us. SPX is a $5 billion North American pumping company that many of you will know. I'm not going to drain the slide. Uh, we also work with NGOs to make sure that we really stay grounded in terms of what is important in the developing world. Looking to the future, I've got to work out where to press this. Uh, looking to the future for a couple of years, I guess there's two things we're looking to do. One is to complete our field trialing which is obviously key in terms of eliminating any more technical risk. And secondly, assembling that sort of ecosystem of partners in order to go to market. And therefore, in that context of what we're focused on, our needs, which are shown on the right here, really are around the skills and experience to do the field trialing, um, combined with this sort of alliance development and business model refinement skill set. Um, also, finance is important. Uh, clearly, the more of it you have, typically the better. Uh, and it enables us really to accelerate time to market and also expand the range of products which, uh, for, for, for the many applications this technology has. Uh, we have discussions ongoing with one investor for a $3 million injection for 5 to 10% of the company, which sort of translates to 30 to $60 million valuation, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, and then find, uh, just sort of wrapping up in terms of opportunities for launch members, um, there are a lot of them. I've talked about a number of them uh, from irrigation and drinking and sanitation, maybe in the developing world, uh, through um, a lot of industrial potential as well as domestic potential to use waste heat um, to do useful work. Um, some potential high-tech opportunities, and I really don't want a question in the next bit on any of these, uh, maybe uh, chip uh, heat removal for computers or for heat from fuel cells. I don't think I could go second level on that one. Uh, and therefore, in summary, really, I think what we have is a unique technology, 
Uh, we're very excited about it. I think probably the patents testify to its uniqueness. Um, we also think it's very good fit, uh, and you did a wonderful job, Victor, in, in picking us, uh, to um, the theme, really, of this event, which is really around energy efficiency and innovation, and I, I hope you sort of got a flavour for that. We see many um, potential applications, lots of global markets, and some advantages compared with other technologies, uh, and we're very excited about the journey, and we hope that a number of you around the room will choose to join us. Thank you very much. So I'm sure you're all very pumped about pumps. Very good. Oh. Thank you. A little bit of levity. Um, I'll just write that one down. <laughs> questions. Jigga. So I, I, have, um, I just have some technical questions. Just a few things around where does the heat come from in some of these applications? And so like how much of a, of a temperature delta do you need minimum to be able to run the pump? And it wasn't a plant. <laughs> um, so in terms of sourcing heat, uh, if, if I set the context, we, ha we have an evaporator, a condenser, which drives the, the thermodynamic cycle, uh, that drives the pump, creates the pumping action. The heat is obviously driving the condenser, uh, sorry, the evaporation process, and we would typically use what's being pumped to drive the, the, the cooling process. And that heat can either be sourced from waste heat in an industrial process or a domestic process, or alternatively can be a low-cost um, solar thermal collector out in the field if you want an off-grid type application in you know, the developing world. To answer your second question, the sort of delta T is we can, we can do it with 20 degrees. We prefer 30 you know, 35. So it's actually quite low grade heat that we're using. And I think that's part of the innovation here. It's not, you know, 700 degrees or anything ridiculous like that. Celsius, right? Well, it's a delta T. Celsius. 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 Okay. C. Yeah, it's only 30 degrees. Oh, I'm sorry. C. Okay. 30 degrees, whatever you choose. Right. Thank you. Okay. I was going to ask. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. How much heat does it take to pump how much material? OK, great what question. Material? Thank you, David. Um, two answers to that. One, based upon our calibration, which is pretty detailed, a kilowatt of heat coming in will pump about 1,300 litres an hour going out uh, at about five metre head. So that just gives you a flavour for the scale of it. Um, the spec is really for 1,000 litres an hour, and we've had it running regularly at 1,500 litres an hour. But I just want to give you a flavour. Can I just... Um, the second answer to your question is the technology is very scalable. So if I take one of those pumps, um, if I make it eight times the size, I can pump about 100 times the volume. So it goes up by just over X squared. Karen. You're, so I think he's got a second... Part to the Didn't mean to hog it. The uh, <laughs> other question was about your demonstrations. What size demos and what have you demonstrated to date? How long has it run? What's your reliability? Okay, so um, we are in a situation where we are in um, a lab environment. So we're, we're embarking on field trials and all that that says to you and all the alarm bells going off, quite right, so I don't want to mis mislead anybody. Um, <laughs> We've had this running, uh, you know, it runs all day without any problem, basically. Um, and it's been running at, you know, 1,300, 1,500 litres an hour quite happily. So I, I think I would characterise it as it's very robust, but it's not proven in a field trial. And there are clearly issues that need to be dealt with, and that's a little bit of what the Wellcom Trust is, you know, is, is hoping for us to do. Okay. We're going to go to Carrie, and then if we can sort of bounce across the room, there's three questions, and then I think we'll close it off there. Okay. So I realize you're in the lab setting, but say for the agricultural pumps, what are the price points? Okay, so um, I give you an indication, and my indication is $100 for a um, pump which will deliver 5,000 liters a day with four hours of sunlight. Um, you know, which typically you can get, if you, if you can't get that and it's pouring with rain, you probably don't want to be irrigating anyway. 
Um, um, so, I mean, that's, that's to give you a flavor. And if you compare and contrast that with, um, you know, treadle pumps, for example, it's very competitive, particularly when you take into account the fact it can go deeper, pressurize higher, and you don't have to spend any time doing it. So there's the time, there's the effort, and there's the nutritional cost of sitting there pumping all day. Is that okay? okay? Thank you. Um, just a quick clarification. Um, to follow on from the a question that Carrie just had, uh, one of your slides said $900 extra per year. Um, and that would relieve a person of four hours uh, per day of treadle pumping. Was that correctly understood? And, uh, and so my question is, so my okay. question, how many people will that relieve okay. of four hours of treadle pumping okay. per day? So and my second question is, um, besides the energy input, what, are, what is the input in maintenance and spare parts okay. for, for such a unit? Okay, so two great questions. Being a bloke, I can probably only cope, retain one of them in my head at the same time, but thank you. So uh, in terms of your second one to do with maintenance, our belief is it will be materially better. And the reason is because it doesn't have, it, it has very few moving parts. So if you compare it with a treadle pump, which has all the seals and so on and so forth, um, because ours is a fluidine um, uh, approach to this, we essentially have a unidirectional valve, and that's pretty much the only moving part here. So what would be a cylinder is actually done with fluids, and therefore there are no seals. Now, please remind me of the first question. Uh, yeah. oh, oh, it was to do with time, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah, how uh, many uh, people okay. are you relieving right. of four hours of work per right. day on treadle pumps by the okay. investment of $900 per year? Okay, so both statements are true, but they're not related. So the four hours a day has nothing to do with the $900. The four hours a day is an additional benefit that I would probably characterize at $80 a year or something. The benefit there is that the person is not standing there pumping away all day, all right, and the nutrition, and they can go and do more useful things. The incremental income comes from use, being able to exploit drip-fed irrigation in a way that no other pump can, because we're able to deliver um, the irrigation with much higher pressures and typically, these, these, these um, treadle pumps are doing flood irrigation. Compared with drip-fed irrigation, that is, that is uh, you get higher crop yields, you get uh, less fertilizer use, you get water going to the, the, the crop roots at the right time, uh, and half the water doesn't evaporate, which it does with this technology. So if you go through you know, the United Nations reports, so on and so forth, and I mean, I've been through loads of them, the $900 incremental income is a reasonable uh, number to take. I think the point I would make to you is that compared, with, you know, even if I'm out by a bit, compared with 365 and tying up half your day, this technology, for a comparable price, delivers a much better outcome in terms of income and therefore in terms of health potential as well. And we can definitely pick those questions up. I have yeah. two questions no, let's pick, let's and two up. minutes left. I think it's Nick and then Guy, and then if you could keep your questions as questions and keep them brief, and then we'll close up. So thank you for that presentation. Thank you. Um, can you help me with the, the initial application? Because uh, startups typically have to have one or yes. two uh, alpha customers and right. one prototype. Um, Excellent question. Thank you very much. So in terms of our technology, um, the two applications which are a good fit at the most simple level are one, open circuit pumping in an agricultural context, which we, we touched on a little bit here. The second is potentially in the solar thermal arena for closed circuit pumping, by which I mean people using solar panels to generate hot water for their home or to heat their swimming pools, which today have um, pumps, you know, electric pumps essentially doing that circulation quite often. In fact, in an earlier version of this presentation, we had a, a Grundfos pump, you know, and, and part of what Grundfos is interested in is exploiting the technology as part of their product roadmap, hopefully, um, in, the, in that closed circuit type application. So this agricultural and solar. I did have it at the bottom of one of the slides and I, I forgot to emphasize it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Closing up the guy.
Where's Guy? Uh, Guy Allais with uh, Hi, Intel Guy. Labs. Um, so when you look at the uh, entire domain of, of uh, pressure versus volume, uh, where does this technology fit? Does it, is it uh, low pressure, high volume mostly, or does it span the other quadrants there? Um, so in terms of volume, it is a scalable technology. So uh, what I talked to you about was 1,300 liters an hour. We believe we can go to 100 or 1,000 times that by scaling the technology. In terms of pressure, um, the technology, I mean, we've taken it up to 10 bar. Uh, sorry, that's like uh, 100 meters of head, 100 yards of head or thereabouts. I, I just struggled doing the conversion. So, I mean, that, you know, it, I, I think what I would say is that clearly there is the potential for a range of applications, suit, a range of pumps suitable to the requirements of different applications. Okay? Thank you very much. Many thanks, everyone. Many thanks, Mark. Thank you.